Hello and welcome to Building the Premier Accounting Firm. I'm your host, Roger Connect, President of Universal Accounting Center, and this is a podcast dedicated to helping you start and build successful bookkeeping, accounting, and tax businesses. It's in this podcast that we address the various things that you need to be aware of as you're running your business, but most importantly, do so with the experts. And today's going to be a wonderful show where we've got on Dave Wilson. Dave, I'm excited to have you here. You've got a background in entrepreneurship, more than 20, nearly 30 businesses that you've run, four of which have been successful. This is great. The odds are in your favor, I guess. <laughs> so the point is, is obviously you're now running a very successful CFO and advisory business. I'd like to start, first of all, by, wel- by welcoming you. But more importantly, give us a little bit of a history as to what got you into accounting, how you started this journey. Well, so it goes all the way back to in high school. I started studying accounting in high school in South Africa. And one of the things that you have to do in, in South Africa is actually pick your two subjects You've got four four mandatory compulsory subjects that we would do, two electives, and I picked accounting because my older brother John said, "Don't copy me, don't do art," <laughs> and so I picked accounting because I thought, "Yeah, I got numbers, I got this." And accounting is actually the only class that I failed any of my exams. Really, I failed an accounting exam. Uh, I take comfort in the fact that uh, most of my class also failed. Okay, uh, it wasn't just us. Uh, it wasn't just me that was dumb. There was only two out of the twenty-five or so that actually passed the, one of the exams. And instead of uh, evaluating how maybe the educational system was a little bit broken for us, they, the acting headmaster came in and told us that we were all stupid. So when I made a, a career decision, I thought, you know, I'm terrible at accounting. I don't know why I should study this, but I had always have, well, I've always had a big interest in the language of business. And, and at the end of the day, accounting is the language of business. That's and right. So when I started studying in, in college, uh, I studied accounting with the intention of not actually doing accounting as a career. Uh, when I was dating my wife, she she asked me what I was going to be when I grew up. And all I had was what I didn't want to be. I didn't want to be an entrepreneur. Okay. And I didn't want to be an accountant. You failed. So I failed miserably. Here I am, an entrepreneur and an accountant. Uh, and the, the way that we got into accounting is is kind of an interesting path. Uh, uh, after I graduated uh, college with a bachelor's degree in accounting. I was was that also still in South Africa? Uh, we immigrated in 98. So I, I had I had graduated high school. I had passed my accounting exams. Congratulations. Sufficiently well enough to be on like the higher grades, the high levels, and came to the United States with my whole family. We immigrated. Uh, economic conditions in South Africa, they were rough. Right? Yeah. At the end of the day, I think official numbers right now are 40% unemployment. Uh, you're either unemployed or you're an entrepreneur in South Africa. That's just kind of how it goes. Uh, my parents made the decision that it would be wise for them to immigrate with us when we were still together as a family. I've got three brothers. Um, I've I've been lucky enough to actually work with all of my brothers and, and my dad uh, Very in nice. my career. Yeah. We are... Uh, when we immigrated, it was 98, uh, went to college, uh, met my wife. And then at, when I was graduating, I w- had an offer to go work with Deloitte and Touche. Okay. And my brother was uh, working at Countrywide, and he was one of the highest producing mortgage originators for the company in the country at the time. Uh, I mean, that was a – number one, he's a hard worker, and he's really good at sales. He's really good at connecting with people. Uh, it was also a function of timing. It was a economic boom of people wanted money and yeah. everyone believed real estate would never slow down. So we, we did really well. My my brother invited me instead of going to Deloitte, oh. but to go work with them in banking. Okay. So I, we did that. And from there, we started a mortgage bank. Uh, we, we got into insurance. We got into mortgage brokerage. Once we had left Countrywide, obviously, and so the so the the twenty different companies, twenty or so different companies, uh, we figured out it only takes one. You, you only need to be successful at once. once. Uh, you can fail as many times as you want; it doesn't matter. Uh, it, it only takes one to be successful. unless the success is at the start and the other failures follow, and you eat uh, up all of your uh, earnings uh, there. Well, yeah, as long as you don't eat up all your earnings. I have seen people that have been very successful on the first go and then they uh, complete failures afterwards, but it doesn't matter. They, they're they still holding on to their successes afterwards. Yeah. So uh, about midway through that experience, after the, the, the economy turned, uh, 
when mortgage originators became the bane of anyone's existence we got blamed for everything mm -hmm. the, uh, yeah wasn't true we didn't we didn't give out we weren't trying to give people bad debt or any of this um some of those crazy loans the the stated income stated asset loans that's right we, most of our clients were were high net worth they oh. were entrepreneurs okay. they were california based um they were aggressive they're trying to buy up real estate um and that's sort of how we got into providing advisory is because we were we were visiting with people about debt and when the real estate markets for residential real estate changed people started asking us questions like hey can you help me get financing for my business can you help me get inventory financing can you help me with uh, i own an airplane can you help me finance this plane and so we started getting involved in business financing commercial real estate financing and we would get asked a lot of questions like, hey, can you help me set up my Gmail? Can you oh, recommend an attorney to work with? Can you help? And as you get into business financing, we would start to see that the accounting, the bookkeeping, the reporting was really far behind. It was it was really far behind. Um, and and through a whole bunch of other, there's, there's like a bunch of mess in the middle of all of that uh, where we went back to school. I got my master's degree. My brother John also went and got his MBA. Uh, worked as a controller for a large shopping center. Um, we went to go work for Morgan Stanley. We worked with Merrill Lynch. We did financial advisory there. Um, we we started getting involved in people's businesses where they would give us some ownership in their business, and then we would provide like 50% of the IP, the intellectual contributions to these businesses, the technical setup, the accounting, the financing, this this whole piece. But uh, we weren't taking compensation, we were taking ownership. And that's a, a great strategy if you have money still sitting in the bank. Yes. Uh, that's a great strategy if you have money sitting in the bank. We still needed some, you know, so in lieu of compensation, you took equity. Yeah, and yeah. and, and right. what we realized is that the, the the turn time to be actually compensated was a long process, and there was one particular entity that we said we're at. You can have your equity back. It's going to oh, really? take so long for you to like turn a profit for us to get paid. It's it, like this, I, we can see it coming. You've got five years and we're not, I'm not sitting around making contributions for five years to hopefully get paid at the end. And we gave him his equity back and he said, well, can I pay you at least for the accounting and the, the financing help? And we, we threw out a number that was like $400 an hour. And he said, sure. And this little light bulb went off in our heads like, well, why, why did we just do that, right? Why don't we just do $400 an hour? Now, that's not what we actually started with, but we, uh, my brother and I, John, we were in business at the time, and we had this conversation that was went something like, uh, we should stop doing all these other things and we should just do a bookkeeping business. We should just do- Focus. Focus, do one thing, not not 27 things. We should do one thing and we should do it really well. And we have the skill set to do really good bookkeeping. Um, and is that the start of Proven CFO? That was actually a start of a company that we called Zenkeep. We were in Texas at the time. Okay. Uh, it, there was an entity that we had called Red Oak Financial that had like two or three bookkeeping clients my dad was actually working on. He was doing some insurance and some bookkeeping. And my brother and I had been involved in all these other little businesses, as well as being financial advisors with uh, Morgan Stanley at the time. Okay. We, uh, uh, entrepreneurs are crazy. We're crazy people. I recognize that. So it probably all sounds insane. Uh, and we flew out to California. We had this business. We had this business that we had built a wireframe, and a, it was basically a real estate related application with technology that we had built. And we went out to go raise some money, and I we had this conversation with Janina Pulaski, who was the creator of eLoan. And she ended up talking to us for about an hour about her chicken coop. Okay. Right, instead of about this this product, this company that we wanted to raise money with, yeah. we were sitting there with a, another Menlo Park friend of ours who uh, had introduced us to Janina Pulaski, and we we're uh, hoping to raise capital for this other business. 
and the conversation was weird, right? We sat across from this person and she's great, but she had no interest in our business. She just wanted to tell us about how she had used Google Earth to identify the best position in her garden for a chicken coop. And we left that conversation and we said, what are we doing? Like, what is wrong with us? We're having these, this is not real life. And we got on a plane and we, f we were flying back from California to Texas and we said, uh, well, one of our companies that we'd been involved in, he wants to pay us $400 an hour for bookkeeping. Uh, this other company we were involved in, we just had this, this strange conversation with a potential capital partner that didn't make any sense. What are we doing with our lives? And my brother, John was like, we should just do the a bookkeeping business. And it was like all my dreams of grandeur, like uh, I'm going to be this, I'm going to be a, uh, this great uh, creator of an angel company or a unicorn company, kind of like they died at 20,000 feet. And I had this thought going through my head is like, I failed accounting. I, I failed accounting in high school. How, how can I do this? Is this really what I want? Accounting is a hard thing. It's not a, it's not, it's not like, hey, we're going to create this great company. It's going to be worth $100 million. It's something that's more tangible. It's something that's more real. And uh, these these thoughts were running through my head. And I had, I shed a little tear. Like, uh, you know, am I really going to do this? And when we landed, I felt really good about the decision. I was like, you know, I actually, I do have this. This is something that I can do. And I don't want it to just be, I'm, I'm the guy in the back with a uh, little armband thing and a green hat and a like a 10 key i want to be someone that if we're going to do accounting and bookkeeping i want to provide something of um of an advisory contribution to the business as okay. well i, I don't want to just do the the numbers I, I want to be involved in the business uh, as a part of that business you feel you have something more to offer than just the financials yeah uh i, I like the financials uh, I like it a lot, actually. It's it's part, actually part of a, a big part of the job that is dependable, uh, that doesn't have crazy ideas at one o'clock in the morning. It's something that I can just go in and and trust that I can get to the right solution. The business, uh, the entrepreneur, the people that we interface are there. It's like herding cats sometimes, uh, which is the the part of the job that I find challenging. It's the part of the job that I hate and I love at the same time. Very good. So, yeah. So, John, he proposes this. You land the plane in Texas. You're okay with it now. You shed the tear. You're good to go. So, you start the bookkeeping business. We started a bookkeeping business. We we went from, we had that one client, that, the, just the one that had offered us this uh -huh. uh, crazy $400 an hour thing. We figured out that what we really needed to price was about... Um, $75 at the time. We were trying to hit between $50 and $75 an hour. Makes sense. Is what we tried for bookkeeping. And yeah. so we went and looked at, uh, at different accounting platforms and we ended up uh, settling on picking one accounting platform, which we picked zero. Zero. Uh -huh. um, it, we felt like it would give us a little bit of differentiation from QuickBooks instead uh -huh. of trying to do QuickBooks Online and QuickBooks Desktop or Peachtree or all, all the other platforms. We figured out that we wanted to at least concentrate our tech stack rather than the the type of business that we were focusing on. So we picked zero. Um, we went and did some hard sales. We, we knew some people that could potentially use bookkeeping and we hounded them. We said, I want to visit with you. I want to sit down with you. I want to look at your business. I want to look at what you're doing. Uh, at first they were a little bit hesitant. So it was a restaurant business was the first actual one that we went to go and sell. We threw up some wix.com websites or something. So it was really bad. It was terrible. It looked horrible, <laughs> but we had, we put up a website so that we could say that this is what we do now. Yeah. And it, it took us probably four hours worth of sales to convince this company to let us try and do their bookkeeping. And and their bookkeeping was in shambles. I mean, it, of course, it, it was terrible. The, the, um, but once we had one client and we pick, we did pick him up and the, the pricing was hard on us and we did way too many hours for that clients and we, we weren't averaging no hundred dollars an hour we were doing 35 dollars an hour it was terrible right but uh -huh. but it was one client and from that one client we were able to go and approach some other people and say hey we we are doing this for another client we'd like to see if we could do it for you so each additional sale from there we were able to use 
it's kind of leverage, right? We were able to yeah. provide background and say, hey, talk to these guys, and this is what we're doing for them. So each additional sale that we made, we were able to make sure that our pricing was getting a little better and our process and our products and the service that we're offering got better on each sale. As you were describing that, you were reminding me of the door-to-door salesperson that comes and says, well, your neighbor, Sally, she's doing it. Yes. And I don't know if you know the Thompsons down the street, but they're doing it. It's the same strategy. Uh, even even worse than that, because we wouldn't just stand on the doorstep. We would go straight in the house. We just assume, we make the assumption it's not it's not true, but you just walk into the house, right? Uh-huh. Uh, so you walk into the business. We, we, we literally walked into people's businesses. And of said, course. Hey, like I want to sit down with you in your back room and let's have a conversation. And so we just hit up people that were business owners. Uh, it was, it's, we don't like aggressive sales, but the first one, two, three, five, you need to be a little bit more aggressive than you want to be. You need to take the haircuts so that you've got a story to tell and you can figure out your process and what what it is that you're going to be offering. As hard as it is, that's how most of the stories begin. I, I really mm-hmm. do believe that that's how most people start their businesses is they try to create that narrative of I'm doing it already. And it's not the, the fact that they wanted to take that client or perhaps do it for as little as they may have done, but they needed the background. They needed the confidence to go to the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth clients. And then you start to that book of business. I've heard people do that for free. Now we, we yeah, we, I've I, heard the same. I, I I dislike the idea of free. We thought about it. Okay, we we did. The the thing about offering the service for free is that you devalue yourself entirely. Yeah, I don't agree with that, but so, I do know of that. So we so we would always position it as though we were winning too. Now it wasn't truly a win on on our, our end on some of these clients, but. It, it gave us the narrative to be able to say, hey, we're charging such and such and so and so, and this is what our pricing looks like, and this yeah. is what our strategy looks like. And that and that company was just a bookkeeping company. We weren't trying to provide advisory. We weren't trying to provide you know, technical assistance. We were just implementing Zero and uh, Gusto, uh, which was Zen Payroll at the time, mm-hmm. yeah. and we implemented Build.com. So we really had three softwares that we would go into business uh, with, um, the funny part was one of our clients ended up being a company called Mom and Popcorn in downtown McKinney, Texas, and she, her business was not producing any income from her. So, so this is where it got a little bit interesting for us. Well, not it was interesting already. We 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 got to about twenty or so clients. Uh, it wasn't yet producing enough income for the three partners. So my dad was a partner, my brother John was a partner, myself. Yeah. Um. We ended up with uh, one, two employees at the, about the time. And one of our clients, this mom and pop company, she decided that she wanted to sell her business because she just wasn't making, she wasn't really making payments to herself. She was able to cover employees. And she said, would you help me try to sell my business? And we took a long, hard look at the business and decided that we wanted to buy her business. And we had her seller finance the entire thing. So we put no money down. We didn't pay her a penny. Uh, and she sold us her business with the that we were going to make payments to her. So it was a seller note, which was better than, uh, you know, on a, I forget what we bought it for, but it was going to pay her more than what she was getting paid out of the business currently for us to, to pay her this note. Yeah, she was coming out ahead. She was coming out ahead, and what we did is we implemented some of the softwares that we thought would be good to implement in a business. So we implemented um, uh, e- an e-commerce platform. We, we put in Shopify, and we put in uh, a new Vend HQ, which was a point-of-sale software, and we started to try and implement what we thought would be a good tech stack and a good process inside of a business that we actually ended up having control over. Uh, we had an operating partner. We, we knew somebody that actually, uh, the way that we found out about the client in the first place was her upstairs tenant. So in downtown McKinney, they had a storefront at the bottom and the tenants upstairs up tenant top. up yeah. top. And we knew the tenants. We knew them really well. And so we made him the operating partner, him and his wife. Oh, so, genius. And their two kids. So we had inside, like, just come downstairs and work all day and um so when we went to clients, we could tell like, hey, we actually are in this with you. We're, 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 we own the, this downtown mom and popcorn store. And so most of the people that knew me didn't even know that I did accounting because they just thought I was the popcorn guy. Um, 
So about six years ago, what it, when it ended up happening is we had a we had a need to move back to Utah. It was a family need. It wasn't a business need, and so I didn't feel with Zenkeep. I had three employees at the time, and I didn't feel like I would be able to manage the business remotely. Uh, it was it was a foreign concept to me to think about. I can't see my employees. I don't yes. know what they're doing. Uh, I can relate to that. It was I, like I I. I feel like now with the world that we live in now, you know, seven years later, I could probably navigate that a lot better. But we made the decision to sell Zenkeep. So we sold Zenkeep. It was it was my, you know, our first successful exits that in the past, we hadn't ever sold a business that had come to run its course. Um, we had successful businesses before, but we're in the mortgage industry, but when they died, they, they died. We, we buried them, right? This one, we handed the reins to somebody else, which was a great event. It wasn't a lot, lot of money, but it was enough to say we've had a successful exit. Did you keep any equity? None. Sold it all? Okay. So, sold it all. And then because we were now here in Utah, we were like, now what, right? And, and why didn't the father and and brother want any equity either? Well, no, we- Because everybody was coming here and they every, all- Everyone was coming okay, here. Okay, everyone was interested in selling, all right. We, we don't all live in the same house, but we, we have a <laughs> tendency to live fairly close. I think the the experience of leaving Africa together as a family, and we've, we've ended up making decisions that have brought us close together as a I family. Love it. Uh, and that's part of the reason why we've ended up working together, I think, is because of this idea of- You're in it together. Yeah, you know, life is short at the end of the day, and you, you might as well work with people that you enjoy working with. Yeah. All right. And so it's been, I've worked with my brother, my older brother, John, and I worked with my younger brother, Sam. Uh, for a while, we had my younger brother, Ben, in our in the business as well, which was, uh, it's a hard process to go through working with family because you've got that barbecue, weekend dynamic that you uh -huh. got to deal with as well and then what ends up happening is we talk business all the time or yeah. like there's no hey did you see the the lakers game it's like hey did, what's going on with marketing yeah <laughs> right? and you know i have a brother of mine that happens to have a business where he employs his children and yeah. so his children are older they all have their own families and i was speaking with him once about the stresses he experiences running the business because he owns the company and he goes out and he acquires the clients and then his his children are doing the work. And he realizes that if he if the economy slows down, if he can't get the work, it's not just his own household that struggles, it's his grandkids are struggling. His <laughs> yes. his grandkids aren't aren't doing well. And so he was communicating to me how stressful it was that he was in a situation where he felt the entire burden of not just his own home, but all of his children extended. And that was fascinating to have that conversation with my brother to hear how much stress he was under in that situation. Oh, gosh, I can relate to that. I I I I I can actually feel his pain. Well, the thing is, when it goes right, it goes right for everyone. Yes, right, which is which is a good feeling. But when it goes wrong, it's kind of the guy, whoever's sitting in that seat, that hot seat at the top is feeling like uh, something has got to change. Yeah. Um, that, that's, it, it's, one of the, <clears throat> it's one of the hard parts about a family dynamic, but at the same time, I, like, I, trust, I trust who's sitting in the seat next to me. And yeah. I, I understand their, their challenges and their successes at the same time. I can empathize with them a little better than I can with some of these maybe not necessarily as close in you know, a like family dynamic. There's a loyalty. You you definitely know as, <clears throat> as family, they're in it a little bit more than somebody else may be in. Uh, but at the same time, I'm curious, how do you identify one another's strengths to know what roles they each should have? I mean, I could say I want to do sales and you want to do production, but you may well, be better at sales well, than me. I'm, I'm the only accountant that was trained as an accountant in the bunch. Uh -huh. John, John's uh, as CEO, he's really sales and strategy. Sam ends up doing marketing. Um, my my dad is really production side. Uh, how do we identify those strengths? Well, we don't have to sit down and discuss it really. It, it because of how long we've been doing this, or or just knowing each other from a family dynamic. I I know that I don't want to ask Sam to do accounting. Right. Why? Because he's, I mean, he maybe did some accounting in his associate degree, but he's, he's not the, 
He's not the academic that knows US GAAP or okay. understands how tax is going to relate to the transaction. Mm -hmm. And and with, with John, I, I know that I could throw 99% of those things that he's going to get. He's just not going to feel great about trying to sell that or talk to clients about that. Um, and with his background, he's clearly sales, right? It's 10 ties it originates of country, right? He's the sales guy, right? You, now, I can do sales too. Uh, I'm not as good, but good, good enough. But that's not where I'm going to contribute the highest. Yeah. Um, so, so we talk about it. Uh, the other thing in, in a family business, you know, this might be some of the, your audience base as well. The, the you know, husband and wife teams, yeah, uh, people that start much. business together. Uh, we put everything down in writing too, though. Uh, even though we've done this a long time, we put an operating to get uh, operating agreement together. We try to spell out expectations in writing. It it removes that. Um, the necessity for just trust me, right? Uh -huh. Tr trust me is a great conversation until somebody slaps you in the face and be like, well, uh, that was unfair. It, it tries to remove the uh, the ambiguous nature of what's fair and what's not fair. And so, I was going to ask how how well structured or organized is it? And you just answered it's, it. It's it's written. It's, it's in writing. It's it's in writing, uh, and there there are times where we have disagreements, right? That, that we're not the same individuals. We don't think the same. We don't act the same. We don't uh, experience life the same way. Our family dynamics are different, and so we try to spell it out and write it down and have discussions. We have weekly meetings, um, at at least, and we're we're talking about it all the time. And it's it has been interesting because Pro Proven CFO, now Proven CFO started after we left Texas and we came here. We also ended up selling our mom and popcorn business shortly thereafter. About a year later, we, we sold the business. And with Proven CFO, it, we sort of didn't intend for it to become as big as it's become. We, we kind of thought that it would be 10 people or less. And we've just grown. We've, we've grown. There's 26 of us now. We, we broke broke a million dollars in revenue several years ago. We broke $2 million in revenue. We're going to you know, just keep growing. Um, we didn't intend for it to get so big. And so we've, we've had to grow into certain roles. Uh, the sort of the role that I've ended up taking on is not just client advisory because I was doing at first I was doing everything and then mm -hmm. we started hiring and we started hiring uh, partners into our business. We, we call them a CFO partner. They're, now, is this a pathway to partnership, or were they brought in it, as partners? Uh, pathway to partnership. Okay. The majority. Um, now, the the part, partner being maybe not an equity position, but definitely they're okay. incentivized to own the the, the client's relationship. Are, are they benefiting from profit sharing yes. if they're not getting equity? Yes. Okay. It's it's not a. It, I don't have a decision making in this process in the business but I have incentive compensation related to the book of business. And mm -hmm. so they have profit sharing from their book of business. And uh, we had looked at other companies like now CFO, preferred CFO, and yeah. kind of how they structure themselves. And we, we try to do it a little bit differently. Um, so does that mean they're 1099 or W-2? No, they're W-2. They're, okay. they're un unlike some of the others, they we pay their benefits and their 401ks yeah. and they, <clears throat> they don't have to carry their own you know, e &O insurance. And, Very nice. Uh, we we do all the sale work and the leg work. They don't have to go and feed themselves. We feed them. So it's it's basically onboarding and retention. Uh, yeah, and, and even we've we have an implementation onboarding specialist that we hired to try and help them to you know, gather passwords and to do yeah. a, a conversion software. And it's, yeah, it's it's. It has grown. It, it's morphed as as a business grows. Proven CFO is not the like the. It's not our first and with employees, but uh, at the growth rate that we've had, we've had to morph and adjust. And we go through things like COVID. And or when we were do, when we were in the middle of COVID, we ended up doing a lot of um, PPP assistance. Yeah, yeah. Right? So all of a sudden, our employees were loan originators, getting on the phone with yeah. clients and people and saying, "Hey, I think you need help with." PPP and I remember that we were working from home with our headsets on and let's get your numbers in order so you can submit and get what you need. Yeah. It, it's, yeah. It's been wild. So when it comes to bookkeeping, now that you're doing proven CFO, are you still offering bookkeeping and accounting services or have you transitioned <clears throat> primarily into the advisory space? Uh, we offer A through Z. Um, okay. 
So the way that we we handle each and each and every one of our engagements is we put a partner on the engagement. So even if that's advisory partnership is only a couple hours worth of his time, he he's got a team, he or she got a team, and they'll have uh, their accounting manager. It's kind of like a controller, uh-huh. uh, an accountant, and a bookkeeper on every single engagement. So even if the clients just wanted payroll and bookkeeping, we're we're going to have a CFO partner that's at the helm of that relationship because we don't want, in our case, we don't want our bookkeeping and our um, payroll or accounts payable to be the 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 true service that we're providing, right? So yeah, it's an ancillary. It, it is an ancillary. And so there are some clients that we have, uh, the, the client themselves have a bookkeeper or they have uh, an accountant already on staff or the outsource and we'll come in as a, you know, supplements and just do the advisory piece. But uh, I would say a, a big majority of our clients are the whole thing that we do the bookkeeping and the, we don't do any tax, we don't do any audits. We're, we're not trying to provide um, the whole piece, but yeah. really the managerial side of the, the relationship. Okay, so for my listeners, let's try and define a few things here just so that they can understand what we're talking about. Uh, there's fractional CFO, part-time CFO. What is the role of a CFO? What, what's the service you're <clears throat> offering? And what is it that the business owner should understand that they should expect from your service? So I'll, I'll give, I'll actually give that through a story and anecdotes. I have a client and she's worth mentioning. Her name's uh, Stephanie and she runs a business called Ox and Pine. And this, this business produces leather related products, okay. uh, leather goods. And she started out by making leather journals. She had a passion for making journals. She, she liked journaling and scrapbooking. And she started uh, making leather products. And I met her before she really started this business. Uh, just she had this interest in leather. Okay. And she knew that I had this Zen Keep business and she knew that we had this mom and popcorn business and she started asking me for advice. And and this the role that I played as the CFO in her business, even though at the time it was it just started out as friendship. Yeah. Ad- advice of the CFO was, okay, so this is we don't need an attorney for these things. Go and file your, you know, your articles of organization, yeah. and this is how you put together your, um, you know, your organizational docs. And uh, let's take a look at your financials. How is, is this going to be a bootstrap business? Yes, you're just bootstrapping this whole thing. So let's let's talk about what you need and when. So let's let me help you implement the technology to do your bookkeeping and your e-commerce platform. Do you have anyone to help you with e-commerce? Okay, you do great. That's great. So and it was uh, when they started making money. She started selling the product just on Etsy. Uh, we were just looking at Etsy reports, and she started making a little bit of money enough to to justify paying yourself something, right? Yeah. And she was just working out of her garage. And it progressed. And as things progressed, I would give her different advice. She would say, how do I hire? You know, she, how, how do I how do I sit up? How do I hire a W-2 employee? I've never done this before. I don't know what I'm doing. It didn't, she didn't know the phrase W-2 at the time, right? So yeah. I was like, okay, so you got a difference. If you're hiring this person and they're an employee of yours that are going to come work at your place of business, that needs to be a W-2, not a 1099. And I would explain the difference and then uh, walk her through each of the stages of growth, the stage of hiring, the, the stage of having to deal with sales tax now, uh, stage of uh, that, do I need to offer benefits? And and so these the conversations that I would have as CFO – is if it relates to money, right? In some way, in in some way, shape, or form, I am providing advisory service for that that client. And now, now she's she broke a million dollars in revenue. She has a large warehouse space, and she's continuing to grow. And she's asking me questions like, "Okay, I'd like to take this to the next level. What what, what do I do? What do I do now to try and grow this business?" And I'm saying things like, "You need to figure out your." your marketing strategy in such a way that it you can tell me you know your cost per click you can tell me your cost to acquire a client you can tell me the lifetime value of the client we need to gather these ideas now do you want to raise money stephanie yeah tell me about that she doesn't know about how to raise money or what or that how means much. or anything about that she yeah. she she she's she's figured out how to be a a great manager she's figured out how to be a great employer a great leader uh, she, her product is wonderful 
but but just because you got good product doesn't mean that you get it out there. So the this the role of this CFO has been in in market at some points. I don't remember when she hired us. I think actually she was our first Proven CFO client. Okay. When we started Proven CFO, she's like, can I hire you? And I said, yes. So it's just been that process where we've watched her go from $200,000 in revenue and uh, we got hired on to, you know, we're going to hit a million and a half and work towards 10 million. Now she's saying, should I raise money? And I'm talking her through that process because they're profitable. They've got the metrics for it, and it would be interesting if we can isolate just you know that marketing strategy, and if we how much if we raised X number of dollars, what that would produce in terms of revenue. So that's the role of the CFO that we were providing. We do her bookkeeping, meaning uh, we connect to zero and her bank feeds, and mm-hmm. we do her you know reconciliation work, and we help her with the filing the sales tax and calculating the sales tax and connecting the Shopify to zero. Um, but that's, that, that, that is, that's the bookkeeping. That is that's the, the that accounting. Is, yeah. Which is, which is great because uh, I have, I have a team, uh, the Jacob and Parker and Jordan, they're, they're taking care of the bookkeeping and even a lot of the managerial accounting and doing the inventory now and trying to figure out, make sure that my, my margins are accurate. And, but I'm, I'm not doing that stuff as the CFO. I'm just having these crazy conversations, sometimes not about the money. It sort of relates to money now, but it's like, hey, this employee is causing me a headache. What do you advise? Yeah. So the way I like how you describe it is that you've basically given it a practical scenario with her story. You can see the evolution she's going through as a business leaning on you for that insight and advice. Because when I've described CFO services as it relates to bookkeeping and accounting is bookkeeping is the recording of the transactions, preparing the financials, accounting is the analysis of those mm-hmm. reports and understanding what's going on in the narrative, the story of accounting, because accounting is the mm-hmm. language of business. But when the business owner is trying to make decisions about operational things, things. How much money do I need to be collecting from a customer when I initially get the sale so I can cover my COGS or cover payroll before I actually do the work? Well, this is a cash flow related question. It's it's going to the bank and getting the loans, getting the line of credit. It's establishing basically the operational procedures in the business, when to hire an employee, whether or not to offer benefits, doing pro formas, budgets. All of those things are essential to the business owners, especially as they're growing. And that's from the CFO space that we're providing that service. And I think a lot of times in the bookkeeping accounting, they kind of lend themselves to those types of conversations, but to formally organize your services to provide that and get paid to do that, that's a totally different thing. And that's what you're doing. Yeah. So for for the listeners here, I, I would describe it as you only need to be one step ahead of your clients in order to provide something of value to them. Right. And so for a lot of entrepreneurs, having been in that space, uh, sometimes out of necessity, they'll try to get that knowledge themselves uh-huh. because they don't know where to find it. And so they, they might be trying to do the bookkeeping themselves. They, you know, like, hey, I'm married. I'm going to make my spouse do this. I'm just going to force him or her to do this thing. Well, they're uh, supportive. They're they want to help. They want to help. So what can they do to help? Well, they can do the bank reconciliations. And a lot of times it's wrong, but it doesn't matter at that stage because they're like, I, we're making a little bit of money. This is great. So I, I can see money coming in through the bank. Who knows what my accounting is doing, right? Uh, tax strategy is not even a, like a thought process at, like when you're starting out. In, in order to, to, to provide something of value, you need to be one step ahead of the clients. Uh, and yes, the organization of that into a service is is actually what makes it something that's tangible and viable and pricing it out. So uh, in our case, the way that we started with Proven CFO, we actually broke it into three segments. We said a bookkeeper is going to be X dollars an hour, an accountant service is going to be X dollars an hour, and the CFO service is going to be X dollars an hour. Now, in application, we, we end up just blending it all together mm-hmm. and figuring out what the monthly recurring is going to look like and throwing that at the client saying it's going to be $1,000 a month or it's going to be $4,000 a month, and that's what it is. Yeah. Uh, on our end, we're trying to figure out, are we making money? on this. Uh, A lot of clients these days have moved away from wanting uh, hourly services. They don't want, hey, uh, this month I worked two hours and next month I worked 40 and here's your bill. They they want to be able to depend on something. And so something more predictable. Yeah. In our case, our our pricing model has moved towards a a month to month recurring model. So we don't fix them in for a 12 month period. 
a lot of clients, it's a lot easier to to tell the clients if you want to get rid of us, just get rid of us. Mm -hmm. You're not fixed in. You don't have to worry about legal and getting involved in that. And we earn our services like a Netflix subscription. Like if, if you if you have Netflix, you pay the X dollars a month. If you yeah. have proven CFO, you pay X dollars a month. Yeah. Uh, and so we end up the way that we end up trying to price out the engagements is we talk about those three areas of what we're going to be contributing. This is our bookkeeping services that we're offering you. This is what when the accounting steps in, verifying the data and producing the reports and the graphs and the charts. And then your CFO is providing two, three, four hours worth of advisory around. It's going to get on the phone with you and talk you through what those results actually, how you apply those results because the knowledge is great. But what do you do with that? All right, so let's break it down into yeah. two things. You brought up pricing, and you you showed that internally you're looking at bookkeeping, accounting, and the CFO as something separate. You're quoting the client a single dollar amount. But can you give me some averages for the listeners to understand what you're looking at as the averages in bookkeeping, accounting, and CFO? Yeah, so we 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 spend a lot of time looking at our competitors and what they do, uh, not because we want to copy our competitors, and and not because. Uh, for any other reason of knowing what the market is doing, right? Uh -huh. you, you have to know what the market is doing. If we go out and we say accounting is four thousand dollars an hour, we're gonna we're gonna scare some people away. Uh, maybe somebody could pull that off, but what it looks like in terms of averages, and on average, we're getting about one hundred and fifty dollars an hour if, that we can quote to the clients. We could say. Our pricing is about $150 an hour blended. Um, I've seen rates as high as $350, $400 an hour on the CFO, even higher than that, depending on how big the client is. Right? If you're going trying to do CFO advisory services to a publicly traded company or a massive organization, you could probably get five, $600 an hour, but that's rare and it's those are more, uh, you know, X big four accountants that are trying to price that stuff out. Markets with the type of client base that we're seeing is about 150, well, anywhere between 100 and $200 an hour is somewhere in that mix right now. Okay, and your average CFO client is paying how much per month? Uh, we're we're close to two thousand dollars a month. Very good is, is our average. Yeah, I've seen fifteen clients. to fifteen hundred to twenty five hundred. So that's yeah, right so in the middle. So we're there. about two thousand dollars. We, we we do have an onboarding that we charge our clients because uh, in our case we do a lot of conversion. So somebody is uh, not when, when we look at their books, it's all wrong, right? We're like, you've got negative cash, and your accounts receivable is negative, and your accounts payable is a debit balance, and your <sighs> Equity doesn't make any sense. We're going to do a lot of cleanup, and we're we typically will switch them from an accounting platform into zero, uh -huh. and so we we kind of charge a cleanup fee. Uh, we call it an onboarding, but it's mostly a cleanup fee because we know there is a lot of uh, shambles to to rectify, and so we do charge an onboarding as well, which is typically either one to two times as much as what our recurring monthly is. Spot on with what we do. Set, yeah. We call ours a setup fee. Setup fee. And the yeah. setup fee is the same as the recurring. So whatever I quote as the monthly fee, mm -hmm. it'll be that much more for the setup fee. Yeah. So very yeah, similar. No, it's uh, like it, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, the, the concept of like the markets will drive the behavior. And so mm -hmm. um, the, one, the one thing that I wish accountants, we as an industry would do is value ourselves a little bit more like uh, the attorneys do. Attorneys, uh, apologies to any attorneys listening to this, but as a as a culture, as an industry, they value themselves. They think of themselves a little bit higher than accountants do. Uh, they think they're great. Accountants in general, when I'm, I meet, they don't we don't value ourselves quite the same way, and we provide such a valuable contribution to businesses. You know, we're, unlike an attorney that shows up, spouts or some things, and goes, "Yeah, well, I'm out of here. Peace." You know, he has my thousand dollars an hour bill accountants are we're in the trenches we're in the front line we're, we're yeah. the guys that you know we peek over and we see what the enemy is doing and fix a lot of the problems and I, I wish as an industry we valued ourselves a little bit higher but that's where we're at right now i think everyone agrees with you there yeah all right so how often do you meet with the client then so they're paying you that two thousand dollars a month on average how often are you meeting um, with them especially in the cfo capacity in, in my case, uh, with Ox and Pine, uh, I'm meeting with her at uh, one to two hours a month at, at this stage. Uh, the bookkeepers and the, the accountants might interface with the clients as well, often, mm -hmm. uh, 
basically we, we try to set up a Slack channel with our clients. And so we're in constant communication with our clients so that they can just text us constantly. We're messaging them and emailing them, you know, a couple times a week at least. Uh, me, so my, my client base is, I've tried to narrow it down because I do a lot of training. Uh, I'm not just, I'm a, a producer manager, right? And I am meeting with the my book of business basically every day, uh, thirty minutes to an hour every day, because I've this is where I spend my time with my client base. But I think if we looked at the other CFOs that are working on it, I, it's generally once a week that they're trying to visit with the clients, okay. at least an hour with the clients, make sure that things are running smooth. Sometimes that's more. I, I know that in some of our clients that are bigger that are meeting you know four hours a week yeah and, but sometimes it's less though because the clients are like everything is going great and i don't need anything and i'll talk to you next month yeah yeah so, so from a cfo capacity obviously that's the number side do you get much into the advisory where you're typically meeting with the client introducing a business concept educating them as to why it's applicable to their business discussing ways to implement it in their company do you take that approach at all oh uh, we do but it's it's always really customized it's okay. really it's based on the need of the business and so we don't have a specific industry that we've targeted or a specific set of process we have like guidelines we, we try to use a book by uh, Vern Harnish called Scaling Up in yeah. our own business, familiar with Scaling Up. We try to use concepts like that. Yep. And it depends on the need of the clients. We have some clients that are very happy with their business as as it is, and they're just trying to do maintenance. Uh, we've got other clients that are startup and they have nothing, and they've maybe got some seed capital. So that's... And they'd like some direction. They'd like some direction on what to do yeah. with that. Uh, we do a lot of financial modeling. Uh, there's a fair amount of... For our early stage, we'll do some modeling inside of tools like Finmark and some Excel. I recently did a, an Excel model for a company that wants to go and raise $20 million on a real estate fund. And it was the coolest, it's the coolest concept and uh, the financially makes a lot of sense. And they they basically gave it to me on a, I would describe it as a spreadsheet napkin. Yeah. Right, a, a single page, yeah, some numbers. And we produced a, a just a beautiful financial model that uh, deals with time and changes and valuations and money, and it's the coolest thing. But they're going to use that model to go raise twenty million dollars and do real estate out in California. So it depends on the where the business is. Mm -hmm. We don't have a hard and fast set of rules that we make our CFOs follow. It's just make sure that you're visiting with them and providing them advice we, we actually on our on our team we've got what we call a business strategist um he used to be the um, cfo for new skin out here in in uh, utah county yeah he's he's on on the proven cfo team and we have him doing business analysis on our clients independent of the client relationship mm -hmm. so he's sitting down and just looking through whatever one of the CFOs wants to give him, they say, oh, he has this clients, can you produce a report? So we've we've created like a, it's like a 20 page report. Fascinating. With, uh, you know, KPIs and business analysis and SWOT analysis and things that they could use. And so he sits down, takes about a week and analyzes the business where they're at with the financials provided and then provides a report back to the CFO to give to the clients. And that's kind of our simplified scaling up process that we're providing. I like that. Good, good. All right. So what's one of the things that people most misunderstand about you when you introduce yourself as this uh, CFO, this advisor? Uh, I think the first thing people misunderstand about me is that I'm not the English or Australian. Uh, I'm <laughs> South African. It's the first, the first bit of confusion that people go through when I try to describe who I am. They're like, oh, you're from New Zealand. No, it's South African. And then when I say I'm an accountant, they immediately want to talk about tax, right? So, oh yeah, I've got a, I know somebody that, that needs tax help, and I've, or you must be busy during the month of April. <laughs> uh, we we do get busier. Uh, the the funny thing, even in our space, we do get busier because people realize that they haven't done any of their bookkeeping or accounting, or they don't know what's about to happen, and they're about to meet with their tax accountant, yeah. and their tax accountant says, "I don't do that. That's terrible. I don't I don't want to touch this stuff." So I know some tax accounts that won't try to do bookkeeping. Yep. They they might out of necessity we've met with a few that are like maybe we'll hand you our bookkeeping business because it's not profitable for us and we hate it and it's terrible um so i think people misunderstand that like a doctor 
there are specialties yep. in accounting. The, the, you've got general practitioners who, who might be jack of all trades, and then you've got urologists and brain surgeons. And you know, we're, we're trying not to be, we're not a brain surgeon. We're not, we're not big for accounting advisory. We're, we're a little bit more like a general practitioner for what we do, where we understand a lot of things. And we're not trying to be a tax advisor. We're not trying to be a cost accountant for a large manufacturing firm. We're, we're trying to provide a foundation so that our entrepreneurs, our business owners, our managers know where to go if they need those things. Uh, we're also, uh, unlike a general practitioner, I, I do have a little bit of a gripe with gen general practitioners just prescribing medications. Okay. Uh, we're a good general practitioner, right? Oh. We, 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 we dig into a little bit because we know a little about a little about a lot of things. So not an antibiotic for everything. There's not an antibiotic for everything. There's no one size fits all. We're not going to make you fill out a five pay, like a five questionnaire thing. If you've got depression, they're just going to throw a drug at you. No, we're, we're, we're a good GP. What okay. you, well, but back in the old day, remember when the GP would show up at your house? House visits. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're more like that than, than just a prescriber of medications. And that's, um, we will point somebody in the right direction if they need a good tax advisor or if, if we need to bring in a specialist in a certain area. Right? All right. All right. So because you're from South Africa, um, I know a few people from South Africa. So I have to ask, do you have a favorite childhood memory? So, so I I uh, I describe where I'm from in South Africa like a mixture for my the American viewer here more like a, a mixture of Florida and Hawaii. So the the climate where I grew up is just perfect. There's there's no air conditioning or heating in most homes uh -huh. because it's not necessary. Uh, for the first time in 20 some years, I went back to South Africa and I was visiting with some friends and my kids and I, we had our t-shirts on. It was the middle of winter and the people that we were visiting with, uh, they had their jackets on inside the house, but it was like 68 degrees in the house. And they're like, oh, it's chilly today. And <laughs> we're sitting there and we're like, man, this is amazing. This is such good weather. Um, so favorite childhood memory, I where I grew up was really close to the beach and I spent a lot of time at the beachfront, surfing, just being in the water. So um, is this like Johannesburg? No, I'm I'm from a city called Durban. Durban, okay. Yeah, the the suburb of Durban called Pine Town. Uh, grew up in Pine Town. Went to Pine Town Boys High School. Oh. I have I have too many good childhood memories. Uh, I think if I had to put it in a grand perspective, I think the best. Uh, as a child, one of the things that I got to experience was in 1995, South Africa hosted the World Cup, Cup. of Rugby. Yeah. And, and I think in some ways that was a really good time for South Africa as a collective because it was the attempt of, you know, if you watch the movie Invictus. That's the th one th I was thinking of, yeah. Th there's a lot of sentiment in there that was actually, it's really true. It's not just Hollywood. You lived it. And, and yeah, it's not just Morgan Freeman, Hollywood, Matt Damon, and this idea of Nelson Mandela trying to unite a country. It is it, it is what was actually happening. I remember seeing Nelson Mandela on on the, the TV and the screen, coming out, getting booed by people because you know, from a lot of people's perspectives, he was a terrorist. Uh, he had been in prison not because just political things, and. He comes out and he's he's wearing this you know the Springbok jersey and he's waving to people and he's talking with the Bura, the farmers and he's speaking Afrikaans to them, and it I think it changed the I think it changed the world actually, but in South Africa there's this idea of like okay, maybe it's not going to be so bad right there the the sins of our fathers and what was happening is like well are the is this the problems that have perpetuated for generations are they going to be handed to me. And there was this feeling, I, I was 15 at the time, and there was this feeling like, you know, maybe it's not going to be so bad. Maybe, maybe we can do this. Maybe we can be the rainbow nation. Maybe we can represent what it's like to fix problems. Now, it, it hasn't been perfect since then. Okay, and, there's, and there's still problems today. Oh, there's lots of problems, okay? But but there, even going back to South Africa now, there's still this, there's a good, there's still a feeling of camaraderie among people. Like, hey, it's okay. We're working on this. We, we can do this together. It's not for the faint of heart. Okay? It's it's very difficult, and there's there's lots of things that they're struggling with. But that that feeling, watching that World Cup rugby game, uh, watching this the just I mean it was a rugby game, and rugby is hard to understand 
even for people that play rugby, like, I don't understand what I did wrong there. Sorry, sir. <laughs> right? <laughs> what did I do? I, I don't know. But watching the game, watching the country unite, the, they, they played the rugby game on speakers at the beachfront. Like, the, it was live everywhere. Yes. Uh, supermarkets had the, the game on. Uh, you, I have Everything stopped. Everything stopped. Well, people went on, but everyone was listening to the game. And, and being a part of that, that was probably a, like a highlight of a childhood memory. Going into like how many good waves I got, so that I have lots of those as well. But <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny. And by the way, it is a good movie. I enjoyed it. It's that. a great. It's a great movie. There's some. There's some things in there that uh, uh, Matt, Matt Damon did a pretty decent job trying to represent a uh, Francois Pinar and some of those guys. A like, rugby player. Yeah. It was, yeah. It was good. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, rugby is pretty big here in Utah. Yeah, the Warriors. And the, a fair number of South Africans get involved in putting that together, and yeah, they're fun. Yeah, I know the coach of one of the rugby teams here. Yeah. So yeah, no, yeah. it's a big deal. The the funny thing is, is when I, whenever I meet somebody from uh, the here in the states, they're like, "Are you South African?" And then they're like, "Oh, I know a South African." And then they tell me the name. The weird thing is knowing that person, right? Oh. It, it's a country of 40, 50 million people, and it's funny to be like, "Hey, do you know so and so?" And and any in any other place in the world that's a crazy question like hey do you know like steve young or like sure whatever but the funny thing is how many people i actually do know when you say hey do you know so and so and the answer is yes funny. it's always strange all right okay good all right so since we're on the personal side of things do you have a favorite holiday movie favorite holiday movie it's always lord of the rings lord of the rings lord of the rings lord of the rings but that's new zealand it doesn't matter. It's uh, Tolkien. Tolkien. Tolkien yeah. When when he describes the Misty Mountains, he's describing South Africa, right? So because he spent time there, and uh, I don't know. It, it's a good story. The, the, this this concept of you know right and wrong and the complexity of it, and uh, Frodo getting taken over by the corruption of the Ring, and the, the, all the backstory. I mean. I don't know of any other stories or movies that have got that much detail and backstory behind everything. If you want to know about why the ring existed, there's you know, thousands of words that have been written about this yeah. concept. It's a good story. It's a good story. There my kids go. love it. My wife loves it. All right. It's, All right. So when was the last time you watched it? Uh, my brother and his kids and myself and my two oldest kids, we've just finished watching the uh, the entire uh, the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit. We we watched it the for a, for about an hour each week. We spent and we watched all the extended editions. So we've, we started watching it like nine months ago, and we just finished it. Oh my heavens! We watched the the Hobbit too. The Hobbit's not as good because there's some weird stuff thrown in there. But we watched the Lord of the Rings first, uh -huh. the whole thing, and then we watched the Hobbits. We were gonna watch the Rings of Power, uh -huh. the TV show, but we're not that interested in that one. There you go. I mean, I watched it. It's okay. Yeah, maybe I should go back and watch. It's been years since I've seen it. It's so. it's it's a good movie to watch. I, I watch it for. I mean, I watch it for the story. I, I watch it for the the concepts, the plots, the the details. Oh. I, I like. I read the book. I'm a I'm a big enough of a nerd that I've read the read the books, the books, and, okay. and then read you know the Silmarillion, and then some of the writings of Christopher Tolkien. And all right, so recently, Game of Thrones. I couldn't get into the Game of Thrones. Okay, uh, I I tried. It was. I mean, the 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 story is great. Part of the story is great. I think uh, author George Martin is a good world builder. I don't think he even knew how to finish his own story. Yeah. So he he's good at writing worlds, and so you you'll find that there are certain authors that are really good at world building. Now I think uh, the 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 Dune. Uh, yeah, Dune. I'm actually interested I, in yeah, Dune. I've, I'll watch a movie. I think it's great, but I think the world building there is amazing. But some of the story arcs become like convoluted, and yeah. I guess that's real life. It is. But I don't. I don't watch entertainment because I want to be reminded of real life. I want to. I want to watch a, like a, a complete whole story that has a start. A so are you big into the Marvels then? Uh, I was until the last. Uh, the Avengers, and then it sort of fizzled out with like She Hulk, and yeah, I, I've sort of lost interest right now. I, and the ratings are suggesting the same thing. I think the Secret Invasion thing, the ratings are like fifty percent, and wow, the and the recent Quantum Mania or whatever is also hasn't done great. Huh. So I, I think Marvel, I I think people are superhero burnt out at this point. 
That's my opinion. Yeah, you're like I, I'm way burnt out. I was a huge nerd, comic book nerd as well, and I'm like, okay, that's enough for me. <laughs> well, I, I think there's a, a change in genre going on with movies and entertainment right now, and you've got the strike that is yeah. happening while we're recording this. I think that's going to impact hugely the entertainment industry. Back in the previous strike, what it turned into is a lot of reality TV. <laughs> And the reality TV came from a lot of the writer strike. Because they, they needed content. They needed content. So they just throw up a camera on people and they'd record, <laughs> you know, Gene Simmons and uh, the Kardashians. And, and that's where you ended up with these various uh, live shows, the Osbournes. Yeah. Yeah. So all of those were. The newlyweds. Kind of, I remember that now. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. that's where it all came from. So, well, the, the crazy thing now is we've got this concept of the AI, the rights. That's instead of AI doing the things that we don't want to do, AI is doing all the things that we want to do. Arts and literature is being now created by the mm -hmm. chat GBT and Leonardo.ai. It's like. So on the on the note of ai i read something that was quite interesting they were explaining how entertainment was going to be infected by ai and they were suggesting that it would eventually get to the point where you would be able to basically share what it is you liked and appreciated in the story the arc and everything else and ai would create for you the characters the storyline the entertainment and it would do a series or a movie or something to you but nobody else would be watching it. You'd be the only one that would would see it because it was created specifically for you. That's, that's bizarre. I, I, I heard a phrase, it was a rock star that said something like, uh, you don't have to worry about AI actually doing stuff like that because AI is never gonna like uh, throw a crazy party and throw a TV into a pool. Right, <laughs> like it's not, it's not gonna be unpredictable uh -huh. the way that humanity is. Yes. I, I think, what makes life interesting and, and what's entertainment and concepts, all this stuff is because we're unpredictable. We're, we're not, we're not formulaic. And at the end of the day, I think AI is going to be, it's going to retain its formulaic nature. So the way I look at it is similar. It's the fact that reality is stranger than fiction. <laughs> yes. You, you can take a story that's real and you would actually say that can't ha that couldn't have happened. That's just so bizarre. Uh -huh. And if you saw it as fiction, you'd be like, that was just a stupid story. But in reality, it happened and it was exactly that. So it's yeah. kind of interesting. All right. So you brought up Nelson Mandela. So whether it's him or not, I wanted to ask if you could sit down with anyone and ask him anything, who's somebody that you would like to learn from? Living or dead? Living or dead. Well, Nelson Mandela would be one. Oh, really? Why? De definitely. Well, at, at, you know, politically, the guy was a communist. Okay. Uh, politically speaking, he, he had co communistic ideas, but the reason for those communistic ideas stems from the position that he was sitting in where he's looking at the quote unquote weird capitalistic approach that was the South African politics at the time, which also they, they uh, only, you know, 10% of the population was allowed to vote, which is insanity. And so he had these ideas of like, you know, we need to have equality, right? So his ideas around communism, I don't think would stem from a bad place but but i'd love i'd love to hear from somebody like him like you know how did you get to this point and, and how do you see this working correctly because you know i feel like we're approaching this concept of late stage capitalism now which mm -hmm. is a bit of a concern for me because i don't think that there are enough big companies that are <clears throat> truly socially responsible in their capitalistic approaches you know hearing about these billionaires that Got the crazy ideas. I mean, I, th I think it's a bit disgusting, but I don't like the concepts of communism. I don't like forced equality. I don't think it's possible. I don't think it's. I don't think it works. I think you know the the concepts of choice and and uh, thriving in an environment and and growing something. The, the capitalistic ideas are, are good, but we need something that works for more people. All right, so I'd love to just hear from someone like him. Like, so how did you f imagine this working, Nelson? I mean, this is South Africa. 80% of the people are black. There are like 11 different tribes and they don't all get along, okay? The Zulu and Koza, when uh, there was a million man march in Durban shortly after he came out of prison, 94, I think it was, there were riots in the streets and there were the Zulu and the Zulu were very upset with the ANC. ANC was more Koza. And he came and he talked to them. He said, throw your pangas in the sea, right? Like, this is not how we're going to solve problems. He, he dealt with real big problems. And I would love to just hear like, okay, Nelson, how, what was the next 30 years supposed to look like? Because now you're gone and we've stuffed it all up. 
this is not what I, th I don't think you imagined it going this way. What do you think we should be doing? All right. Just to, just to get his perspective, I think. I love this. This is beautiful because I agree with you. I think there's some intellectual people out there that have vision. They have this ideal that they're striving for that they feel can benefit the masses, if you will. And I think they have great intentions, but along that way, there's a lot of things that have to change and it ruffles a lot of feathers. And uh, I, I presume, as you were just since, uh, explaining that the end of capitalism may be on the horizon. Well, yeah, that, that's kind of a harsh statement. And I was wondering, is that associated with Ayn Rand with Atlas Shrugged? Uh, a little bit, yeah. There's there's some ideas in there about late this concepts of late stage capitalism. I, you know, I'm not a Marxist or a communist in any way, shape, or form. I'm okay. very much a capitalist, right? All right, All I'm right. very much a capitalist, an entrepreneur. But the way that we've approached it in our own business, right, is like more people need to share in in the wealth that's created, and and it mustn't be forced. It mustn't be mandated. It needs to be done by choice. It needs to be done by socially responsible people that are saying, okay, I, I am in a position of power or a position of wealth and I need to help more people. But uh, it's kind of like right now we glorify the winner and we ignore the loser. And, and that's not, when, when I think about Nelson Mandela, he, was, he wasn't trying to do either one of those things. He wasn't trying to glorify a winner or ignore a loser, but he also wasn't trying to fix all the problems. So I'd, I'd love to hear his concept because the country of South Africa is very diverse. The white people don't get along with other white people. There's Afrikaans and there's Eng English, okay? And the whole Boer War was, you know, our our revolutionary war. And so it's kind of like, you know, even the Civil War, North versus South. We don't all get along. We, we don't come from the same backgrounds, the same ideologies, the same concepts of how to create wealth or religion. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a New York of a country, right? And so he was a visionary. I think I don't agree with all of his ideas. I think some, mm -hmm. uh, you know, he, he, when when he talked about uh, the United States, he didn't have very nice things to say. And I was like, okay, this is our trading partner, bro. Like, shh, <laughs> <laughs> don't 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 open your mouth to everything. Uh, I I just I just think that this the we don't need, you know, the end of capitalism. I think we just need to approach capitalism being mindful that there are those that aren't going to be able to be um, entrepreneurial. Uh, have you ever seen the movie Ratatouille? Yeah. The concept is everyone can cook, right? And anyone can cook. Everyone can cook. But it's really not everyone is going to be able to be an entrepreneur. Not everyone is going to be able to just start a company and go through the, all that rigmarole and then be successful at it, right? So we're only going to have a few that are going to create unicorns. But the guys that end up creating unicorns, I think they need to be a little bit more mindful of those that can't catch up to where they're at. And I, I don't know what it looks like, which is why I like it. I'd love to hear what the visionaries are going to do about it because I'm I'm probably not going to be able to do much about it. I'm yeah. just going to be able to sit here and say, hey, we, we need to take care of each other as best as we can, whatever that looks like. I don't know. But. Well, I'm going to add to this. I've got a friend that uh, is a quadriplegic, and uh, he does quite a bit. He, he accomplishes quite a bit on his own. And one of the things that's fascinating is he's very, very aware of all the help he gets along the way. Because although he's very successful, he's conscious of the fact that he couldn't do much of what he does without the help of others. And so yeah. he is conscious of all that. Now, related to that, um, one of the things that I think is important is I don't know that there's a right or a wrong, but there's a dialogue. There, there is a dialogue, and I think the world has changed a lot. We're a lot more aware that we're all different now. I, I think at least in the first world countries, there's a lot more dialogue about this idea of equality or fairness. Uh, we haven't figured it out yet, is my thoughts. We're, we're not there yet, but at least we're talking about it, about how to be a little bit more mindful of each other and the differences that we have. And the the one thought that i have is is perhaps we need to not necessarily focus on our differences as much as we need to focus on our similarities the things that bind us together the things that that make us human the things that you know we all collectively care about and i think that that's where entrepreneurism capitalism the this you know the the example that america sets in the world stage because america is an example it is a it's a massive it's a massive economy it's a massive um I mean, all, a lot of the entertainment in the world, a lot of media that we get in the world comes out of this country. So I'm really, at the end of the day, I love being an American. Right? I look at America's problems and I go, yeah, I, 
I see these problems. They're not the South Africa problems. I'm really grateful to be dealing with American problems now. Uh -huh. I just think like maybe the next 20 years brings a lot more understanding as we go through the hard conversations. Yeah. I, th I think where we're at is we're having hard conversations. 70 years ago, we weren't having hard conversations. We were shooting at each other, right? Yeah. <laughs> we're like, your, your political ideas are bad, very bad. We're like we need to change those. Well, on, this, on the tone of entrepreneur, one of the things that I would stress is the fact that you are taking an entrepreneur who can see the strengths that others bring to the equation and they're able to take and ex not not necessarily exploit or take advantage of, but leverage them. And in leveraging them, bring money and uh, you know create product and so forth. And I like that. Well, I, th I think uh, anyone that's uh, to your listeners as well, that they're, they're, they're entrepreneurs. They're also interacting with a lot of entrepreneurs. And we, we can make little differences in that as we give advice to people. A lot of the advisory that I give uh, has undertones of doing the right thing, right? Mm -hmm. I, I, I try not to dictate what people are going to do. We, we sometimes describe what we do as like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, you're, you're a hunter and you're going to be hunting animals and I'm going to help you build the gun. I'm going to put the gun in your hands and I'm going to help you aim it at the target that you want, but I'm not going to pull the trigger. But you know, this, this concept of a, of a hunt, it's kind of like, you know, animals need to be culled. It's, it's a harsh reality in, in South Africa game reserves that they have to do stuff like that. But the, the message that we give to our entrepreneurs is like, hey, you, this is something that you need to do that's socially responsible. I don't want you pointing this thing, this this power that you have in this business that you're creating because you you hire people. You, you talked about your brother's, this feelings of anxiety and stress that he's had because of his, of his children and his grandchildren. Uh, yeah, it's, in our case, I think of each one of my employees as though they were family. Yeah, and I know that's a silly thing to say. It's a very, we're all family here. No, we're not. But but I think of them and their children and the stresses that they have to go through, and I feel really responsible for their well being, and that we've created a company that they enjoy, that they can enjoy participating in. And the advisory that we give to our entrepreneurs is very similar. It's like, okay, you need to be mindful of the fact that you might be sitting on 80% equity and you want everyone to work as hard as you, but just keep in mind that they don't have 80% equity. And when this company sells and you make a bajillion dollars, they're not, right? They're going to be sitting here still working and they're going to be like, oh, look at the company we built. Well, they might have helped you build it, but they're not going to be the beneficiary of all those things. Yeah. So I try to give a lot of undertone on, on the conversation about being – N nothing is ever fair, nothing is ever equal, but this concept of taking care of other people as best as what we're able to. Right? Empl that, employees, clients, vendors, we need to just do right by each other. And that's, you go back to that question of Nelson Mandela, right? I think the, the why it impacted so many South Africans the way he did is because he could have done it differently. He could have taken, like he could have, come out and been a dictator he could have been rob mugabe he could have done just like every other african when they changed political power he could have come out and been a dictator and instead even with his you know like i said i didn't agree with a lot of his politics but the way he went around doing it he was mindful of the fact that the boer the english the Tosa, the zulu the the, the bela all these different people in the country they had different needs and they were in different stages and he was trying to be mindful of the fact that he's trying to bring this all together. Yeah. So he did what he could, right? So same concept for us as entrepreneurs, as advisors, as people that give coaching to businesses that we might be able to do some small influence. Like, hey, this client has got 20 employees and they're socially responsible. They're, they care about their employees in such a way that they don't see people as a commodity or as, a, as just a like an expense on the on the P and L, they start to see people for, you know, we're all people, we're all in this together, and some of us have the ability to influence that.
I love it. This has been a wonderful conversation. <laughs> I, I've really enjoyed it, Dave. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to actually wrap this up. And as I wrap it up, I'm going to come back to you for a closing thought. All right. So for my listeners, first of all, one of the things that I want to point out is Dave's been so kind to put in the episode description his contact information. He had loved to connect with you via LinkedIn, as I would as well. But at the same time, he's providing some information there that if you'd like to reach out to him and his team to maybe find out a little bit more about their business and how they're working with clients, you can definitely check with him on that. The other thing I want to point out is as a summary of our conversation, conversation. I thought the discussion was amazing. One of the things that we really got into is your bringing up uh, your high school, picking the, the career path, failing at accounting, but yet today being in, in, in accounting, offering accounting, bookkeeping tax services or uh, uh, CFO services. And I think that's very true. A lot of the people that I work with as they start their careers, they find themselves not really, really on the trajectory of accounting, and yet they end up here running very successful accounting, bookkeeping tax businesses. And that's phenomenal. And I commend all of you for that. But in the case of Dave, he obviously went through this journey of entrepreneurship. And fortunately, with his family, came to the United States and started a number of companies, seeing opportunities, taking those and leveraging them into businesses. And ultimately, at one point, realizing maybe we need to be offering bookkeeping services. And while in Texas, he took advantage of that and grew a business there offering uh, bookkeeping services. But the thing that was quite interesting was his story as to taking equity in a business and purchasing also a company. And really, as accounting professionals, we sometimes see those opportunities as as we can maybe take one of these clients that we're working with and maybe do so much more with it than they are. And I think that's something that I hear time and time again that we all also should consider. But from that, he's obviously created with his family, proven CFO, a very successful multi-million dollar company offering CFO related services. And in that process, really assisting businesses with what they need as they're in that growth trajectory. How do they actually address the operational needs of the business? How do they now brainstorm and consider various things that they need to uh, need to address as it relates to capital and revenue and cash flow. All these things are very, very important. And with his company, he's been able to kind of enlighten us today as to how that's accomplished and what that means. One of the things that I really appreciate is also his perspective as uh, a South African coming to the United States. Your story is amazing. And I think it's perspective that uh, we all need to consider. We each have our own narratives, our stories, and hearing you share yours is very important. And as you described where we are in our economic uh, trajectory and history, I couldn't agree more. I think we are needing to have a dialogue and at the same time, in a way that uh, is very amicable and, and uh, uh, polite, we need to discuss what are all the consequences of some of the decisions that we're making in our own companies and how it impacts our clients, our employees, our families. It's, it's a narrative that I think needs to be discussed because many of us are very fortunate in the fact that with our entrepreneurial spirits, we're willing to take risks, we're willing to put ourselves out there. And with that, there should be a reward. But at the same time, we've got to be acknowledging of or acknowledge the fact that people are working hard around us and making things possible. And we appreciate that. So a lot of things that you contributed to the conversation today that I really appreciate some real good highlights. So do you have a final thought that you'd like to offer? Oh, gosh, final thoughts are always the, the toughest thing. I, I think that uh, when I think about the listener out there that's going to be listening to this podcast, I think about where I've been in those in those seats that when either starting out just doing the bookkeeping, not knowing how to put a you know, package or a service together, or 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 struggling with uh, recognizing that sometimes the dollar per hour isn't making a lot of sense, and having to sit and reevaluate exactly what is going to be, you know, happening. Um, the the final thought that I can give is change is going to happen to you whether you want it or not and at the end of the day what we are trying to do or what my advice to anyone out there listening is is try to influence the change in the, the way that you have the narrative control right if you're the one that's in impacting the change or initiating the change you have a lot more control over the outcome not not necessarily right i started out by saying i never wanted to be an entrepreneur and i never wanted to be an accountant and here I am, but I went through that process of change and reevaluation. It's something that uh, I do on a fairly often basis, always evaluating where we are as, as a company. Where do we want to go next? Is this going the way that I had intended it to go or has it morphed into something that I am not enjoying? Uh, and then making a change, sitting down, evaluating, and then doing things to make small changes in the direction that we're going. So the final thoughts is to sit down, evaluate your own business, decide where it is that you are at right now, and then evaluate where you want to be and start putting in processes and steps 
to make that change. Beautiful. And I like how you brought it full circle. You didn't want to be an entrepreneur. You didn't want to be an accountant. And yet here you sit and you're yeah, doing very, very well. <laughs> I love it. So here's my end. Uh, obviously, if you haven't already subscribed to the podcast, I encourage you to do so. Set your notifications. Each and every week we put out an episode that you don't want to miss. And so I encourage you to go back and also listen to the past episodes. Binge listen to those. We've got some highlights. You can go to universalaccounting.com and there find actually a collection that we've put together, a playlist of various topics that you can take advantage of. I also invite you to register for GrowCon. Come to our annual event. It's for the owners of Booking keeping accounting and tax businesses. It's a conference that you do not want to miss. It's where we put on the stage the experts that you can hear from, what it is that they have to advise us as we're looking to grow our businesses, offer quality accounting services, and do, do so efficiently and profitably. It's there you get to meet your peers, interact with individuals that are doing just as you are, and collaborate. Find individuals that you can perhaps team up with. And then lastly, it's the team here at Universal Accounting Center that's committed to your sec success. It's basically helping you so that you can be in business for yourself, but not by yourself. Now, now, the last thing I'd like to also mention is you can go to the uh, website universalaccounting.com and find free resources. These are a variety of resources that we provide to you to assist you as you're growing your business, a variety of books that we've collected and uh, made available to you for free as eBooks, uh, different reports and tools that you can take advantage of. So check out that resource. And then lastly, with regards to universal accounting, if you would like to take advantage of these principles that we've brought up, things that we've discussed here today, check us out. You can go to universalaccountingschool.com as well as visit us by uh, going to universalaccounting.com for more information about the various programs that we offer, particularly Particularly for today's conversation, I would recommend checking out Becoming a Profit and Growth Expert. It's literally how to market, sell, price, and fulfill CFO-related services in your firm and provide these quality services to your clients. So with all that being said, I thank you for listening. And always, if it's about accounting, it is universal. Take care. Have a great day and be safe out there.